So I'm going to talk about food and uh, more specifically about gastronomy. Uh, we'll see in a while what does the term entail. Uh, I hope you can relax now, you can forget about the jam. Uh, I hope you will enjoy the presentation as much as I've enjoyed preparing it. So, okay. Does it look familiar? Yes? Okay. I didn't hear the name? Lemak, Lemak, Nasi Lemak, Nasi Lemak. Okay, so why do I take it uh, as a prologue? Oh, sorry. Uh, this, maybe you read in the press, or you have heard, there's a lot of discussions about it. Uh, Sometimes Nasi Lemak is coined as the national dish in Malaysia. Uh, have you heard this, this phrase? Nasi Lemak national dish? Uh, so, what we can do as a prologue together is try to have a bit more detailed look at this uh, very delicious dish and uh, see why or why not it should be a national dish and how does it relate to number one, uh, national cuisine and number two, Malaysian gastronomy, which is not exactly the same thing. We're going to see the difference in a short while. So, what do we have this the nasi lemak in its uh, simplest form? We have uh, rice boiled with a bit of uh, santan, coconut milk inside, hard boiled egg, timun, cucumber, it can be lees, uh, dry anchovies, peanuts, and the famous sambal with all its variation sambal tumi, sambal bawang, sambal patai, and so on. So, uh, I love nasi lemak. Uh, whether it should be a national dish, I'm not sure, but it's indeed a it's not a gastronomic question, it's a political question, right? So, but if we look at the ingredients, uh, the rice is very interesting because in anthropologic, anthropological terms, sorry, it can raise the question whether uh, Malaysia or the Malay world can be considered as a rice civilization. We also are also going to study this in a few minutes. That's number one. Uh, then, if we look at the peanuts, for example, it poses a challenge for um, positing uh, uh, nasi lemak as a national dish because peanuts are not uh, endogamic. They, are, they don't grow in Malaysia originally. They have been uh, naturalized. I mean, they come from Latin America. So then it uh, challenges a bit the uh, assumption of a truly authentic national dish. And uh, the sambal, I like it very much because if we consider that Malaysia, for example, is a collectivist society. You know, many anthropologists, they say, like, okay, the West, they're all individual, individualistic societies. In the East, for right or wrong, uh, Asia hosts many collectivist societies. So there's a difference in terms of values between the West and the East. But I like the sambal because if we look at it from a sociological point of view and not from an anthropological point of view, we can say this where the individualism comes into the dish. Because uh, if, you want, if you go to Nasil Mak stalls, what makes the difference is the sambal, right? Most of the time, okay? And it's a bit, if you compare, it's a bit the same if you compare it to a French coffee, for example. If you go to a restaurant, Western restaurant, you, you have a, you take the menu, okay? Uh, special uh, delicacy from the chef, okay? So the menu is designed by the chef. So in a way, when you eat the restaurant menu, you submit yourself to the art and the craft and the desire of the chefs. But you, your individualism take over when it comes coffee time, because every one of us, we want something different for coffee. Sugar, no sugar, milk, no milk, you know. Uh, cream, no cream, short, long, add a bit more water and so on. This where the individual personalization comes into play. So it's a bit the same for a sambal within a collectivist society, this way, uh, the vendor and the consumer assert their individualism through the way the sambal is cooked, to me, spata, etc., bawang, or the way uh, you choose the stall because of the sambal, okay? Just a bit of discretion. So, anyway, uh, so nasi lemak national dish or not, I'm not too sure because it belongs to Malaysia, yes, but it belongs also to Singapore, you like it or not, uh, Singaporean's neighbors. But it belongs beyond this to the Malay archipelago. 
before uh, colonial borders, it was Nusantara, so uh, Nasilumak uh, didn't stop at uh, the borders, you know. So, so you see all the ambivalence of claiming uh, Nasilumak as a national dish. So maybe, maybe it is a sterile debate. So let's go beyond this debate. And in order to clarify a bit what follows, uh, let's make a preliminary distinction, very important one, between national cuisine and gastronomy. Okay? In terms of anthropology, but in terms of political science as well. So, of course, it can be discussed. There are many definitions of gastronomy, many definitions of national cuisine. This is a problem we have in social science because it's not an exact science. So, it's theory versus theory. But if we look at national cuisine, nation, uh, national cuisine is, of course, is a political construct. This, uh, how you want to anchor your citizen a sense, with a sense of belonging to the nation. So through proclaiming, for example, certain dishes are a national dish. Uh, and I love this phrase uh, very much by an American Indian anthropologist. Uh, maybe some of you know him, uh, Arjuna Padurai who uh, wrote this seminal article, uh, Cookbooks in India, How to Make a National Cuisine, in 1988. So what he did, he reviewed many cookbooks in English medium in the 80s. And uh, his findings were, were very interesting. He found that through uh, using English as a medium and through uh, publishing worldwide Indian cuisine, uh, it was Actually, the, he was witnesses two processes. The first one was decolonization of Indian cuisine. Number two, through the cuisine, he was a culture, a national culture in the making. Uh, that's why I like this uh, phrase very much. So, bringing people together through a sense of national cuisine, sense of belonging, political construct. The other one, gastronomy, is to make it simple, is what you sell outside of your borders, okay? Inside national cuisine, national unity, outside what you promote, what you sell to the rest of the world is what we call gastronomy. And both are linked by this concept of haute cuisine. You know, there, there's um, uh, this famous also sociologist from uh, Cambridge University, uh, Jack Goody, who the first, was the first to make the distinction between high cuisine and low cuisine. He was working in a European Middle Age. So to make it simple, high cuisine is the, the, the cuisine of the aristocracy, of the social elite, the lords from the castle, and the low cuisine was the cuisine from the peasants. So if you talk about national cuisine, uh, you need both to make a national cuisine. Okay? You need fine dining and you need mamak sauce. You know? uh, but what you promote outside of your border is usually haute cuisine in a form of a constructed, consciously strategic constructed uh, gastronomy. Okay. For example, um, Thailand uh, is very good at promoting a royal Thai cuisine outside the border, right? And we hardly, with a few exceptions, countries hardly promote uh, low cuisine uh, outside of their borders. They try to promote all cuisine. And uh, for the ones who know him, I'm sure the French embassy uh, people, they know him. This uh, gentleman here is uh, Charles Maurice de Talleyrand. He's like the godfather of all diplomats in France. Uh, very famous. He finished his career under uh, Napoleon I. And uh, uh, he's very famous for having quoted that the best weapon of a diplomat is his cook, and he was uh, allegedly spending every time of his working life, every day, one hour in the morning with his chef, for strategic purpose, according to the guests he was uh, receiving. Okay, so that's the first dichotomy, the initial clarification: gastronomy, haute cuisine outside the border, national cuisine, uh, national identity through haute and uh, low cuisine. The question is, is why do we need gastronomy? Do we really need gastronomy in our country? 
Well, I think we do, uh, but this is a point of view, is because gastronomy, among other cultural production, is a weapon for soft power. Okay, so just, uh, I, I recalled very quickly the notion between, I mean, the difference between hard power and soft power. Hard power is the power of coercion through military or, or financial means, like uh, China owes a part of the debt of the, I mean, of the US debt, okay? Or uh, America uh, has a very mighty military power, this hard power. Soft power relates to culture, okay? Uh, it can be you know, Italian cinema in the 60s. Today, probably, is, I don't know, Korean uh, cinema or, or K-pop, you know. Uh, Vietnamese cuisine, royal Thai cuisine, and why not Malaysian cuisine. Okay. This is how you strengthen or you enhance the attractiveness of your own country through soft power, which connects always with culture, forms of cultural production. And of course, gastronomy is one of them. So the political scientist who coined this notion was American political scientist Joseph Nye. Okay. Just as an appetizer, uh, there's actually, uh, in uh, Malay historiography, uh, there's one episode which relates to soft power and what we call today sometimes gastro-diplomacy. Sounds like a disease, but the term exists. Yeah. Uh, so, of, of course, you all know the Malay Annals, uh, the translation by John Layden. Uh, there are not many entries about food in the Malay Annals. Uh, there are a bit more than six, uh, but uh, the other are more symbolic, so I just narrowed down the one that uh, elaborate on actual food. Uh, so one is uh, interesting because it, calls, it mentions uh, social stratification. Uh, you know, um, uh, the custom of Istiada Sudun, sh uh, sharing the same food tray in Angan. Uh, so only three people can share the same food tray. Uh, of course, the Agong, the Crown Prince, and uh, the Vizier, or the Prime Minister. So the rest, they are below, you know, social certification. But the episode I like very much in the Malay Annals is when uh, the, the Malay court receives a very distinguished, distinguished guest, which is the Emperor of China, Raja China. And there's an episode that uh, relates with food. Uh, among the, the dishes that are served to His uh, Majesty, the Emperor of China, uh, there's a simple dish of Cancun. You know Cancun, uh, sorry, not Cancun in Mexico. Cancun, you know Cancun? Uh, uh, I'm not sure you translate it in English, something like water crest, right? Uh, water glory, yes. Morning glory, okay, thank you. Uh, so, and then, so the, the uh, Raja China is being served, uh, the Kong Kung, and what he noticed is the way they have been prepared, especially the way they have been cut. Because instead of chopping the Kong Kung like, like this, you know, like onions, uh, they split it alongside the stem, which is much more difficult, it's more work and more precise work. So the Raja China is impressed. And of course, the one who chronicled this episode are very pleased that the Rajashina is impressed. So this is a true small moment of soft power through uh, gastro diplomacy. In the history, or alleged history, because it's a bit sometimes it's a bit difficult to separate legend, myth, and history in the Malay Annals, uh, but it's a very interesting episode to, uh, to notice. Okay. So for this talk to exist, like in many academic talks, we must start with a problem. This French tradition, you know. So what is the problem? The problem is uh, if you go on Google, you, you, tap, you, know, you just type Malaysian gastronomy, or uh, if you look uh, in the press, talk to people, there's very little sense of, um, in Malaysia, uh, a very little perception of a Malaysian gastronomy. When I talk to my colleagues at work, they say, oh, Malaysian cuisine is not fine dining, it's not gastronomy. Uh, I mean, it's home cooking, you know? Uh, but more interestingly, 
if you look at all the media released by the Ministry of Tourism in Malaysia, they use the word gastronomy. But what they uh, display is actually just abundance. You know? It's not fine dining, it's abundance of dishes and variety of dishes. Uh, so there's a bit of discrepancy or a kind of misuse of the term. Okay. So the, the self and conscious or conscious representation of Malaysian cuisine is not as a gastronomy most of the time. So, as we said before, it can be interesting to, to uh, uh, portray and promote the gastronomy for soft power reasons in Malaysia. So, if you're okay, we can do this little exercise together. That's a bit the point of the, the talk uh, tonight is, can we invent in a sociological acceptance uh, meaning, can we construct a, a Malaysian gastronomy model that would be perceived as legitimate outside of Malaysia? The answer is yes, of course. <laughs> How do we go about it? First, you remember there's a connection between haute cuisine and gastronomy. So, for our little investigation, we have to locate haute cuisine or high cuisine in Malaysian history. And conceptually speaking, uh, many uh, anthropologists and historians, they posit haute cuisine as an expression or a manifestation of a form of civilization. So that's where we could start. It's not me who said it. You know this gentleman, Claude Lévi-Strauss, a French anthropologist the most famous of the 20th century. He said this, cuisine, not gastronomy yet, cuisine is the process of cooking food as the queen essential means through which humans differentiate themselves from animals and through we, which we manufacture culture and civilization. Okay, that posits another problem. What is the difference between culture and civilization? I'm going to get to this very soon. But you see, in a nutshell, Cuisine is a manifestation, a tangible and consumable manifestation of a civilizational process. So, methodology to locate Malaysian civilization. Number one, of course, a brief review of food history. That's what we're going to do now. Then we spot unique cultural, food cultural markers, because to promote it, you need to differentiate yourself from other countries. And we construct a model with differential gap that just means with a unique model. So our little investigation uh, comprises three parts. Uh, so I will uh, talk first about the very brief overview of the history of food in Malaysia with the little historiography that we have. Then we'll see in part two how can we reconstruct uh, the idea of a Malaysian civilization. I didn't say uh, Malay, I said, I said Malaysian civilization. And part three, how, stemming from part one and two, how can we design an authentic and true uh, Malaysian gastronomy model? Okay? Not sleeping yet? So let's go. So the, the way I'm going to look at history, you know, there will be a, it won't be exactly a factual se sequence, but I'm going to look at Malaysian history from a foreign point of view, meaning from all the countries that, that have interacted with uh, Malaysia for trade, especially, and uh, with all the points of connection that we, we're going to we're going to review together. What made Malaysia attractive for foreign powers? So, uh, and how did it translate? It translated in terms of trade, this attractiveness of Malaysia or the Malay archipelago, migration, colonization, and commodification of cuisine. Okay, let's if we start in the 5th century, uh, early trade in the Malay archipelago, what did the peninsula have to trade at the time? Two things, forest product, sea products. Forest product, you can see, especially birds, and sea products, including pearl oysters. And the first customers, so to say, so to speak, 
uh, started with India. Many historians believe that trade and food trade started with India, Coromandel Coast, even before the 5th century. But the first documented one, I'm sure you heard about the Buddha Gutab stone uh, in Kedah. Uh, you know, it, it was carved by, uh, in, uh, as a tribute to the sea captain Buddha Gupta to thank the gods for a safe journey back to India. So that's uh, the evidence that we have of trade with India, 5th century. And if we look at the uh, 5th century in the Chinese annals, they called a city which is called Kwantoli. Some Western scholars, they translate it as Kwantoli. Nobody knows exactly where it is, but uh, many historians and scholars uh, presume that it's on the northeast coast of Sumatra, not very far from the Straits of Malacca. So these were the pioneering routes of fruit trade. Uh, food trade sorry. And then 8th to 14th century, the trade routes are open to India and to China. And traders start to notice a group of little islands which is going to be the envy of colonial powers later, the Maluku Islands or the Spice Islands. So when we say Spice Islands, what spices are we talking about? Uh, cloves, black pepper, nutmeg, mace, uh, and also cinnamon. Okay. So all what the royal court and the aristocracy of Europe was craving for. Uh, this is a view of Ternate Islands. And of course, this group of islands is not going to, be, uh, to go unnoticed by uh, uh, Western powers. So the race for spice starts. And it starts with the Spaniards and the Portuguese. Well, you know, of course, who reaches first uh, to Malacca. Uh, because in the meantime, uh, Melaka had replaced uh, Majapahit, I mean, uh, was rising above Majapahit, which are already had taken over from uh, uh, Sri Vijaya. And hence this famous uh, 16th century Portuguese proverb, who holds Malacca has a hand on Venice's throat. And uh, that is when the King of Portugal, uh, Prince Henry, nicknamed the Navigator, appoints, of course you know this guy, Alfonso de Abuquerque, Viceroy of uh, India, uh, to establish a trade route uh, starting from Africa uh, to the Indies. And that's what he's doing, starting with the, the Cape, uh, African East Coast, Goa, and then reaches Malacca. And, of course, uh, the conquest of Malacca, 15, uh, 1511, after a fierce resistance, uh, they take over the, the fortress. And they stay in Malacca, not in the whole peninsula, but Malacca, for quite a while. Uh, but they left some influence. And a part of this influence is culinary influence. So the, the most classic... Uh, the most classical one promoted by the Ministry of Tourism is the Devil's Curry. The Devil's being the uh, Portuguese. Uh, tomato inside from uh, Latin America. Chili from Latin America as well. Ulam Raja, Cosmo Caudatus in Latin, is not indigenous plant even though it's very iconic plants uh, for uh, Malay cuisine, but also comes from uh, Latin America. Uh, and one interesting case is the kaya. You all know the kaya, right? Yeah? Uh, very nice in Kopitiam for breakfast. Actually, it seems, according to certain researchers, that there's a Portuguese influence there, because if you go back to Portugal, and if you're interested in desserts, in pastry, they have this a uh, little core technique for pastry making was called doce de ovo, uh, which means basically egg jam. It's a bit like the sabayon, you know, for the French. Uh, it's egg yolk, sugar, a, a bit of warm water, and you whisk it, 
And it's your base for many, many pastries in Portugal, like the famous pastel de natas, for example, if you have been uh, uh, to Lisbon. Uh, so uh, the local population, they saw the Portuguese doing their dessert based on dolce de ovo, and they started with the same core. But if you want to, to, do a, to make a nata, for example, like a cream, like a custard, you know, you take dolce de ovo, add milk, cow's milk, and you add vanilla. Okay, that will be very Western. But uh, in Malay Peninsula, no cows, uh, no vanilla. Okay, so what do you do? You replace the milk by santan, and you, you replace the vanilla by pandan, and you get your kaya. Okay, so uh, very also uh, Malay uh, delicacy, but there's, uh, according to some historian, there would be a Portuguese origin to it. What happens after the Portuguese? The Dutch came, 1610. When we say the Dutch, it was not exactly the Dutch uh, government per se, or Dutch as a country, but it was the VOC, the Dutch East India Company, which had, by charter, had the right to uh, level armies, uh, to, um, to open uh, settlements and uh, trading counters, uh, even to, uh, to appoint um, uh, local nobility. So they were very powerful, and they quickly understood that they had to size the Moluca to control the, the Maluku Island, to control the spice trade. And they stayed also for a while, and they left a little bit of influence, of culinary influence, not a lot, more in Batavia, today's Indonesia, of course, but of course, uh, there's one dish that you can find still in some uh, Malay stalls here. What is the name of this one? Fakidel. Okay. So it's like potato cutlet. So it's uh, the Malay cousin of, cousin of the Dutch frikandel, which is a bit similar, except that there's meat inside. Okay. If you get the German version of it, there's only meat. But the original Dutch one is a mix of potatoes and meat. So it seems through Batavia, through Indonesia, that uh, the Pekadel reached Malacca after having uh, hybridized uh, through Dutch cuisine in Batavia. So that's the Dutch legacy for us. And after Dutch came the British. Uh, starting in 1824, the famous Anglo-Dutch Treaty separates uh, this part of the world between uh, Dutch uh, control and uh, English control. So I couldn't find an uh, illustration of the signature of the Dutch Treaty, so I just found the, the 1846 one, the Treaty of Labuan, where uh, the Dutch was handing over Labuan to the British. Now that we are in the British sphere on influence in history, uh, if you allow me, I will tell you two stories, uh, quite nice, relating to food, uh, that took place because there was a British influence and because of Malay attractiveness as a trade entrepot, therefore that attracted migration. First story is the Kopitiam and the Hainanese cookboys. You know Kopitiam? Yes, nice, huh? So, remember, we are, under, uh, we are in British Malaya at the time. Kopitiam, for the ones who speak Hokkien, they know. Huh? Coffee house, Kopitiam, in Hokkien dialect, or language, sorry. How did it start? It started because of the Hainanese migration. They were one of the latest to reach uh, Malay shores. The first one, of course, were the Peranakan, and they were part of the Sinke, you know, the, the one who arrived last. Okay. And because they were the last to arrive, so they got the menial jobs, the less interesting jobs. So meaning uh, domestic personnel in uh, uh, English colonial houses. And some of them specialize in cooking. And they, of course, they were serving uh, their colonial masters what they liked to eat. So a lot of Western fare, but not only. And then 1957, independence happens. So 
a bit like the maître d'hôtel and the valets of uh, the royalties at the French Revolution, no more job. You know, in France, the royalties, they, either they were beheaded or they fled to uh, Austria or to England. And uh, the valets, either they, they followed them or they stay and they, in France and they opened the first restaurant to make use of their skills. Okay? So the story is a bit similar here to uh, a more smaller uh, scale and uh, a niche is the high school boys <coughs> and employ no more jobs, so what can I do? Hey, I know how to cook and I know how to cook something different because I cook like Western food for my masters. So now I'm going to open a shop and I'm going to sell what I've cooked before that nobody knows how to cook. That's how they, uh, the copy cam came into uh, function. You know this, this one, Chongkok Kopitiam? Anybody knows? Anybody has patronized this one? Yeah? Where is it located? Klang, yes. It's one of the oldest Kopitiam uh, in Malaysia, before independence. And the question is, for the few of you who don't know, what do they serve in Kopitiam? Uh, they serve a typical breakfast fare uh, that everybody's craving, uh, at least I do. Uh, and if you look at Kopitiam breakfast very closely, it's very interesting because it's a kind of reminiscence of uh, all colonial British breakfasts. You know, even the crockery, uh, in a way, emulates all uh, Victorian uh, uh, breakfast ware. And you have the toast here. And of course, we don't have a uh, strawberry jam. Or unless you, you go uh, to a certain part of Malaysia. But uh, we don't have thick cut marmalade. So uh, we localize the ingredients, the Hainanese Kuba localized ingredient, and replace the jam by kaya. The butter sometimes replaces mar margarine. And uh, the soft boiled eggs that uh, the British masters used to have at breakfast, you know, where you crack the shell with a spoon like this. Uh, this one has been also localized, so we deshell it, put it in a saucer, and uh, instead of salt and pepper, we do have pepper, Saracen pepper is better. Instead of salt, we have soya sauce that we put inside. Okay? Uh, so in anthropology, we call this food creolization. Uh, so it's a way of adapting uh, uh, foreign cuisine into the local context by uh, adjusting changing ingredients and adjusting cooking techniques. Okay. So that's the story of the Kopitia. Second story, the story of Bakute. Uh, so this one, I must give credit to one of uh, my students, uh, Li Hanning, who's doing a master's thesis on this. Very interesting one. And there was even uh, an article uh, in the Star about it uh, from her research. So. Uh, Bakute, uh, if I translate correctly, is something like meat bone tea, right? Correct? Yes. Uh, more specifically, pork, I suppose. Uh, Bakute. And uh, the story is supposed to be originated in the uh, port city of Klang, Selongo here. And of course, originally, it was not, uh, sorry. It was not as beautiful as this, but it was as simple as this. Rice, the meat bone tea, tea or soup, uh, with pork ribs and all very gelatinous parts of the pork, the knuckles and so on. And very important, herbs, medicinal herbs, because Bakute had originally, not now, but originally had a medicinal function. Why remember? We are in a port city, and uh, the Hokkien migrant at the time, they were a lot of them used to work as carrier workers. They were carrying uh, heavy loads from the docks to the boats, and vice versa. And facing the sea, the weather is hot and humid. They had uh, joint articulation problems. Okay, and in some uh, uh, beliefs of a traditional uh, Chinese medicine, uh, if 
you know, you have a bit of uh, uh, gelatin there over, or around the bones, you know, for articulation. So they, uh, they believe at the time that if you eat like this uh, gelatin from the, the pork knuckles, then uh, you will get the gelatin you need to oil, in a sense, your articulations. And on top of that, they would add medicinal herbs into the concoction. So it was originally meant to heal through food, food as medicine, uh, the workers from Port Claim. This a sample of all the herbs, you can see Star Anis here, uh, that a traditional bakute should be made of. And uh, because it's a tea, it's a kind of, it's soupy, so it's moisturized also the yin. Of course, today is, uh, the function is totally different. When you go for bakute, it's more of a nostalgic function, maybe, or maybe a sense of identity uh, to, uh, uh, to a Chinese or Hokkien community. So the function has evolved, of course, because of modernity. So that's the story of bakute. And uh, this one, I gave lectures on it, so I will not redo it again, but just uh, to recall, uh, we, we cannot talk about food in Malaysia without talking about mamak. Yeah. So mamak, you all know what it means, right? Mamak, uh, because we refer to Muslim Indians, mamak means maternal uncle in, in, uh, in Tamil. And uh, mamak stalls, uh, this is the stall where we serve uh, Tamil, Tamil, uh, base uh, delicacies, like you all know this one, Tamil Muslim based delicacy. And uh, according to the little historiography that we have, it would have started in colonial Pen Penang. So it's under, again, a British influence. It's at the start of the Industrial Revolution uh, in the form of uh, Nasi Kanda, rice on pole. And then one day, the guy with the rice on the pole stopped bit heavy, and uh, people join and back and around here. And uh, with time and modernity, it evolves through this. Now we can watch football games and have moments of unity in uh, Mamak And of course, it is commodified for tourism a lot. OK. So back to our uh, investigation, we are supposed to shape a sense of a Malaysian gastronomy. I think we haven't progressed much. Uh, <laughs> we just did an overview okay, of nice stories. But that's where we realized the challenge, because there are so many episodes of history, even though are brief, how to capture all this and say and assert, this is Malaysian gastronomy. Very difficult, right? Almost impossible. Because we haven't talked yet about uh, the, the cuisines of the peninsula from the whole society, I uh, mean the Malay and uh, the indigenous group like the Orang Asli. Uh, this is beautiful, by the way, you know, uh, stuffing in, uh, I mean, I like the concept uh, in pitcher plants. So, how can we capture all this? And we haven't gone to uh, Borneo yet, you know. Uh, with all the diversity of the cuisine in Sabah and Sarawak. So it is, uh, now we are cracking our head. Very famous phrase in Malaysia, what to do? Huh? <laughs> okay, little help to help us flashback. Remember, cuisine is supposed to be a manifestation or an expression of a form of civilization. So we have to do something about it. We have to locate, we haven't done it yet, a, true, I mean, a, a form of civilization that rings true to Malaysian history. But of course, being academic, I have to start with the definition. <laughs> Cannot escape it. When we talk about civilization, what do we mean? Uh, because it's not a concept that is uh, being given for granted. So if you um, refer to Marcel Mauss, famous French anthropologist, uh, nephew of Emile Durkheim, he said, for very simple, civilization, no S, is all what that humanity has achieved. Okay? Nice 
uh, holistic sentence. But if you put an S, it becomes a bit more complicated because that means you're starting to identify various forms or categories of civilization. Okay. And then uh, there's a kind of consensus that uh, civilizations plural, is a kind of dual concept because it uh, encompasses at the same time material culture, like when you, uh, you build roads and train tracks and so on, bridges, disease, the tangible uh, form of civilization, you know? uh, meaning you tame nature. Okay? But it's also a set of moral and cultural values. Civilization, look like being civilized compared to being savage. Yeah? So it's a dual concept, material and spiritual or moral set of values, two sets. And uh, that's why some anthropologists, they prefer to use culture because culture refers to the set of moral values or system of values only, okay? Not the material part, at least for many of them. Okay, so civilization with an S, there are many. Which ones? Uh, there was an inventory done by uh, another French guy, French historian, Fernand Brodel, very famous, uh, superstar of the historian, uh, formerly from uh, the Collège de France, and he was very famous uh, for this, also because he did his PhD thesis while he was in a labor camp uh, under the Nazi regime during uh, World War II. So uh, this kind of, uh, this uh, little uh, historical vignette attached to, he, to him. So in one of his famous works, The Grammar of Civilization, or The History of Civilization, depending on translations, 1963, uh, Bordel uh, identifies four categories of civilization. Civilization as a geographical area, like Asian civilization, Western civilization, societies, uh, for example, society can be uh, a country uh, or it can be um, a class of rulers. Uh, civilization has economies, economy of rice, rice economy, trade, or uh, as way of thoughts, philosophy, uh, like the, the, the Greek uh, democracy, for example, or religion, theocracies, country where are theocratic. So you, can, so you see it's more complex uh, than it looks. When we say the word civilization, it can mean many things. So meaning for our little case, uh, for our little investigation on how to uh, fabricate the Malaysian civilization, we have to choose one, we have to identify one, which one we want. That of course will connect eventually to cuisine and gastronomy. But that's not all. There's another uh, definition of civilization that I like, that can be useful for our investigation, is the one by a French geographer, Pierre Gourou, who coined this concept, pastoral civilization. So this is really taming nature, but not constructing bridge or roads. Uh, this uh, about agriculture, okay? Taming the landscape. So it's a very material acceptance, or even technological, of uh, the concept of civilization. So let's try to uh, check this concept, whether they can, some of them, whether they can apply to this part of the world, the Malay world, and especially Malaysia. So I've selected through that could potentially work. Uh, three, sorry. Number one, pastoral civilization. Is, is, is there a right civilization somewhere here? Uh, number two, Civilization as way of thought, so we take religion, Islam. Uh, and uh, number three, uh, civilization as economies, trade civilization. Uh, Malaysia be, having been in the past, uh, very important and still is uh, trading nexus. So let's try to confront this concept with uh, some of our historic, uh, historical data or what we know about it. So number one, pastoral civilization, the question is very simple is, was Malaysia uh, a rice civilization? Can it be described as a rice civilization? Like UNESCO published this uh, brochure, I think in 1984, 
civilization du riz. Okay. So if we look at uh, the FAO map, the UN body about uh, food and agriculture, uh, and if we try to spot the granary area, so mainly millet and rice, see the red dots? First, not that many. And second is west and north. And if you look back into history, it didn't change much. And whether Malaysia was, or the Malay kingdoms at the time were really a rice civilization is subject to debate because uh, scholars uh, tell us that the way the rice was cultivated in the north, the technology they used, was basically technology transfer from uh, the kingdom of Patani. So it was not an uh, endemic kind of technology they were using. And if we look at rice culture in the west coast, the technology transfer has been done by uh, the Minangkabau uh, group, which originated from uh, Sumatra. So two technological transfer. So of course, uh, the local population, local population appropriated themselves uh, the technologies and cultivated uh, rice with a lot of yield, uh, but the technology were not originated from there. So, and uh, the surface covered was very scarce. So it's, it's kind of difficult to posit that Malaysia was a rice civilization. So we have to look somewhere else. Let's try to apply another form of civilization to Malaysia, maybe as a way of thought, and maybe because of course the Malacca Sultanate, uh, Islam, religion. Was, can Malaysia be coined an uh, Islamic civilization? And is there evidence in the cuisines? Uh, first, if we look back at history, before Islam, you all know that uh, the, this part of the world was uh, part of Hindu-Buddhist empires. Uh, so there was a layer, probably, of Hindu, so-called Hindu cuisines. And one of the teachings of Hinduism at the time was uh, if you eat rice, sugar, and butter, this very sadvik, meaning it will give you a pure temperament, which is good for meditation. So this is the first historical religious layer before Islam that uh, connects with food. And then, more or less at the same time, it was concurrent, Hinduism and Buddhism. Uh, what about Buddhist cuisines? Uh, for this, we have to refer back to these... Oh, sorry. to this edict by uh, the Maurya Empire in India, the Akosha's Edict, uh, when the, uh, the king emperor found in himself a true Buddhist and decided to issue an edict, which in a nutshell was saying, do not slaughter living beings for sacrifice, stop. And do not gather for big festival consuming, uh, meat uh, consuming kind of festivals is against the teaching of Buddha. So this edict was spread in the whole country and the empire. And there was a very uh, powerful medium of dissemination for this edict. It was the network of the monasteries. And they, uh, they spread out of uh, the Maurya Empire borders and they came into Malaysia and there was uh, at the time, um, a Buddhist uh, diaspora, and uh, the Buddhist diaspora was comprising of the social elites, uh, intellectual circles, and you all know that for gastronomy, these are the best uh, me uh, mediums to convey a sense of gastronomy, because social elite is uh, what normally generates gourmet or connoisseur. That's how it works in France, for example, royal cuisine, uh, gourmet, bourgeois, and then the people, yeah? So the monasteries, the Buddhist monastery, had this function of disseminating a certain sense of Buddhist uh, cuisine. And of course, uh, there were some precepts based on uh, uh, Buddhism uh, philosophy. Uh, 
which were taken from these two manuals, Karaka and Susruta, which are attributed to semi-mythical uh, physicians uh, that came out with very generic uh, rules for good dietary practices. And then came Islam. So if you look at common de denominator throughout the countries uh, that, um, uh, uh, <coughs> preaches, uh, that were preaching Islam at the time, the common denominator are uh, meat, there is a very meaty diet, flour based, and there's a lot of sweets. But what was really diffused culturally wise uh, was the techniques of roasting and baking through one technology, which was the technology of what we call here the tando. Uh, in uh, Turkish and Ottoman Empire, they would call, they would call it uh, tano. And in France, even, we have a variation of this, it's latano, which uh, was um, the semi-mythical uh, oven for the alchemists. Yeah. Same route. So meat-based diet, baking and roasting for Islam cuisine. And when the Ottoman Empire established themselves, the cuisine became more and more refined. Uh, as you can see here, Buluk uh, Bachi was the chef de cuisine of uh, the Ottoman Emperor. He was in charge of, of course, uh, the kitchen, but he was also in charge of uh, his majesty's well-being, and he was also uh, in charge of the harem, his harem. So, a uh, very busy man. Yeah. And uh, so Turkish Ottoman cuisine was a very highly sophistic sophisticated system, culinary system, which evolved later into Mughal cuisine, which in turn, uh, through the British Empire, influenced in certain ways uh, British colonial cuisine. And you can find some traces in the UK today. Okay. So, Last one. Uh, as you can see, because there are three layers, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Islam, even though some are concurrent, it's also kind of challenging to, uh, to posit that uh, Malaysia was and is an Islamic civilization. Because it was not only that. So, was it a trade civilization then? Maybe, because probably it's the most constant feature since the fifth century until today. So let's see. And let's see what are the products of a trade civilization. What do we trade? We trade goods, food. We trade ideas, like religion, sometimes proselytism, and new culture are being created, like this one, which you know, the Peranakan Indians and uh, the Peranakan Chinese. Uh, what we call in anthropology, creolized culture. And the creolization happens in cultural production as well of this community, uh, like handicraft, dresses, baju, uh, beading, and of course, cuisine, food. Uh, the famous uh, Nonyakwe, and this uh, very nice sample of uh, Cheti cuisine uh, was here with some of my colleagues, I was uh, in Malacca, Kampung Chetis for lunch. Very difficult uh, field work. And uh, I had this beautiful, uh, I don't know if you know it, fish roe curry. Uh, it's a very, it's a true Chetis uh, uh, delicacy. They take fish roe from Ikan Parang. Huh? Not any uh, other fish, huh? Ikan Parang. Because it's more grainy and more crunchy. And uh, they make this curry, which is not too hot, except like today she uh, forgot she put chili, so she put it a second time. Uh, but uh, to balance the santan, the creaminess of a coconut and the fattiness, instead of um, putting tamarind, you know what they put? It's also very interesting, belimbing. You know, the, for, for the ones who don't know, you know uh, star fruit? Yeah? So uh, it's like us very smaller version of star fruit that look like a little cucumber, but the same uh, botanical species. So instead of uh, tamarind, they use belimbing for, uh, to bring a bit of balance through sourness. Beautiful. That's why you can see 
some remnants of uh, uh, civilizational sophistication into this kind of dish. Yeah. Uh, so the gentleman on the video, his uh, name is David Neo, he's a Peranakan uh, Chinese uh, with families in um, Laka and uh, Singapore. And uh, he was explaining to me that uh, Nasi Ulam is like, uh, you know, the, one of the symbols of um, uh, Peranakan Chinese cuisine, uh, Baba Nonya cuisine. And um, it's also a very competitive thing because that's the kind of, uh, that's the key that uh, the kind of uh, indicator that some uh, prominent families in Malacca use to uh, compare themselves, you know, uh, for example, oh, you see uh, this, this, uh, this house and uh, they make uh, ulam with uh, 10 herbs, uh, we make with uh, 16. Like, so, uh, uh, because the Pranakan are very well known to be kiasu, you know, so competition is always in the air. You know? So, why did I choose Nasi Ulam? Uh, because first is the expression through the Pranakan uh, communities of a trade civilization of one of the cultural products uh, of, uh, so to speak, of uh, this uh, trade civilization, you know, creolization of cultures, of people, of food. But uh, uh, there might be something else that Nasi Ulam uh, tell us, I think, is because if you look closely at the recipe, of course, there's civilization, there's culture, it's cooked, but there's also something raw, right? The ulam, edible greens in Malay. So, sorry to be a bit academic, uh, I'll, I'll try to make it uh, very simple, is uh, to get the matrix for our famous uh, Malaysian gastronomy, we have to operate uh, what we call with bombastic words, uh, double paradigm shift, uh, we're just uh, kind of frog leaping, is first we have to shift from the concept of civilization to culture. Uh, if we refer again to Mr. Levi Strauss, culture is what makes us human, for and is uh, encapsulated in the technique of cooking, for example. When humans started to cook, they abandoned nature and they started culture because of fire. So, and remember, uh, culture, there's no sense of hierarchy compared to civilization. Because if you say civilization, that means there are, that implies there are people who are civilized and there are people who are not, okay? Therefore, many anthropologists like me, we prefer to use the word culture because it's more egalitarian. So, but Claude lévi also made a very clear distinction between culture and nature through the raw and the cooked. The raw, the ulam, is nature, and when you start cooking, it is culture. And, but, I think it's, today maybe is a bit obsolete as a definition, because we are, uh, all of us who are staying on the planet, as you know, which is quite endangered, uh, so we have to take care of it. And uh, one of the former disciples of Claude de Vistros, Philippe Descola, who did his PhD thesis with Levi Strauss at the time, that means he's not young, uh, he's just retiring now, came up in 2004 with this very seminal book, Beyond Nature and Culture. So he reprised the dichotomy from his master, the distinction between nature and culture, but he said, uh, we cannot leave it like this, because if we maintain this clear distinction, in a sense, we are advocating for uh, culture over nature, meaning we are advocating for industrial revolution. It was the idea of the time, progress, but now we have seen the damages of progress. So how does it connect with our Malaysian gastronomy? I think, go back to Nasi Ulam, there's something interesting, I believe in it, is in the same dish as a mix of nature and culture, raw ulam and cooked rice, and it's not any Nature is the nature from the land. Uh, so it is a kind of a way, maybe it's me overthinking, uh, but it's uh, uh, the Peranakan Chinese, it was a kind of tribute to the land that hosted them. You know? uh, we bring back our Chinese cuisine um, from Fujian, for example, but we, uh, we inject into it, we sprinkle it, we mix with the product of the land, the nature, the ulam. And uh, you notice, 
the herbs are all chopped and mixed. So we are embracing, in a sense, the land uh, where we live in now, today. So that's why I think it's interesting because uh, Ulam can apply for Pranakan uh, cuisine, but can apply also for many cuisines. And, uh, and if you look at Nasi Krabu, for example, another very interesting example, is the same, if you look at it closely, is a bit the same philosophy as the Nasi Ulam. Because uh, Krabu is also raw, raw greens, chopped differently. And if you look at the community, Nasi Krabu, you know where, where it comes from, right? From which region? From which state? Clinton, yeah. So Clinton is a border state, right? So there are many also creolized community in Clinton, which uh, used to be categorized in colonial census as the Siam Siam, mixed blood between Siamese and Malay. So there's also a commonality with, so the common denominator with the Pranakan, is creolized culture, mix of culture, mix of bloods, and both of them, uh, they form new culture, in, uh, and one of the production of culture is cuisine, and metaphorically, they also give tribute to the land. Uh, so through the Nasi Ulam and through the Nasi Krabu, which also applies the same kind of philosophy. So maybe one way is just a proposition uh, to uh, um, kind of anchor once and for all a matrix, just a matrix for a model of Malaysian gastronomy is through the, for want of a better word, the ulamizing process. Uh, meaning is a way to connect back nature to culture, nature of the homeland, in a sustainable way. And it applies uh, for the food. Uh, it respects the land, it applies for the people. Uh, uh, the creolization of culture, mixing of culture, and all this, uh, I mean, remains together in a rel relative sense of harmony. You can apply it to Malay cuisine, uh, ulam in Malay cuisine, uh, you, can apply, you can apply it to Peranakan cuisine, Malay cuisine to all the states. Uh, that's why I think ulamizing could be maybe a concept, a kind of holistic concept that can uh, cover the whole Malaysian cuisines and uh, serves as a push factor to promote gastronomy uh, outside of uh, Malaysian borders. And there's one last pillar for this matrix that I would like to use just to uh, nail my uh, uh, suggestion is um, is the cosmovision of the indigenous uh, people of Malaysia, including the Malays, uh, through one word. It's not ulam, almost, it's alam. I'm not sure they have a similar root because it's very difficult to find an etymology dictionary uh, in Malaysia. It seems that it doesn't exist, so if you know about it, please, I would be interested. But one thing I'm sure of is the word alam which means nature in Malay, you all agree, right? Yeah. Is of Arabic origin. And if you translate the word alam back in Arabic, it means world. So in a sense, for the Malays uh, and for the people who speak Malay and have been living in Malaysia, their world is nature. So that will be the conclusion of this presentation. Thank you very much.